Hello, I'm Larson the Wolf, and this is Lisa, all caps. I'll be honest, I don't know where to start. Well, Lisa is a post-apocalyptic turn-paced RPG that takes inspiration from Earthbound. This is not uncommon for indie titles, as there is a select group of indie games that do the same with Earthbound. Their own approach on how to do so varies from title to title, and there's a handful of games that actually do it quite well, games like Off and Undertale. Lisa is more closely related to Off than Undertale, as the content is extremely mature. In fact, even more so than Off. Mind you, I'm an individual who has played Sauna Saya, and Lisa can be considered at the same level of uncomfortable content. Lisa also manages this without pornographic content. Lisa was created in 2014 and released on Microsoft Windows, OS X, and Linux for around $10. It was developed by the indie studio Dingling and designed by Austin Jorgensen. The game tackles difficult subjects and has quite a robust fighting system for traditional turn-based combat. One thing the game is, is it's not your friend, and the game wants you to know that. And it will remind you that in case you forget. The description on the Steam page is literally the miserable journey of a broken man. I love this game's design, and not only takes traditional RPG elements that games overuse and makes their use more strategic, but it ensures the fact that once again, this game is not your friend. The simplest example of this is the lack of edge detection throughout the game. In other words, the absence of invisible walls to keep your character from falling off the face of a cliff. So often, and especially in the beginning, you will fall off the face of a cliff and be insta-killed, which means you will have to reload your save, of course. As you can imagine, this was very annoying at first, but a half hour into the game and I adjusted to controls and stopped doing it. For the most part. The game's combat uses a traditional party system with four possible slots, one of them always being occupied by your protagonist, so three possible additional and swappable members. You can switch any of your swappable party members at game posters that hold your current roster. You recruit members to your roster by doing miscellaneous tasks or just talking to some NPCs. Well, there's no real pattern to it. It's just some NPCs can be party members, but most can't. Most have requirements, some don't. You just need to talk to some NPCs and figure out if they're able to join your party, and if they are, do you need to do anything in order for them to be added to your roster? Combat is very interesting, despite it using basic turn-based mechanics as its main force and deciding factors. What I mean is, character stats mean what they always mean. Attack is how much damage you do, defense is your amount of resistance to standard damage, and speed determines initiative, yada yada yada. But on the bright side, there's the traditional metagame that comes with that, you know, the building of a team whose attributes and traits work well with one another. How characters attack is interesting though. All characters have a standard attack with their weapon of choice, and a series of special attacks that use SP, which functions like traditional mana. However, some characters, like your protagonist Brad, can use a martial art. That means you can use WASD when you attack. That means rather than using a single attack, you can string together a series of different blows depending on which keys you used. You can still use your specials, such as Fireball in Brad's case, like any other character. Or you can use your standard attack and do a combo. Like WAD, for instance. This will make Brad do damage with three standard attacks from the W, A, and D. And then he will perform a fireball from the combo you just performed. This essentially gives you two turns in one. There is more depth in some characters' combat than just that, too. For instance, by the end of the game, I had an alcoholic healer slash buffer that drank for his normal attack. Drinking healed him and gave him more SP. One party member was a beast man that SP only fills up when he was hurt or hurting something. There are 30 plus party members you can have, but I only had around 15, so keep in mind there's probably more interesting combat mechanics i never even seen. The game utilizes healing items like any other JRPG, however resting areas and saving spots are separate. The saving spots are symbolized by crows and they function traditionally. You do resting and healing in areas where you can sleep, normally symbolized by a campfire or a bed. And they are a completely different story. In the beginning, the game warns you about using these resting spots, as they come with consequences, because desperate people may come across your unconscious body. I thought to myself, yeah, okay, so I'll lose some currency when I fall asleep, no biggie, right? To which Lisa replied, I am not your friend. 
Yeah, so I virtually stopped using resting places by the end of the game, because I was beaten with a bat and my stuff was taken. One of my members decided to leave my party because he was tired of me. I got a note that said, watch your back, we're always watching, and one of my team members was abducted in the night. That's the RPG equivalent of Nurse Joy taking your Pokemon away after you use the Pokemon Center too much, because you're clearly abusing them. After a member was taken, I had to go to a game poster, use an underachieving member, and get them to the same level as the one that was taken from me. Leveling isn't easy, too, because most areas have a finite number of enemies, and there are very few random encounter areas. What's more, almost none of the random encounter areas are good for farming EXP. Yeah, the pacing of this game is a little off. However, it's perfectly acceptable for the experience I had at the very least. In fact, for an indie RPG, the pacing was exceptional. The buffs and debuffs were a little annoying, however, as Lisa has around 15 unique ones, each with their own sprite, the effect of which is given on a sheet in the very beginning, but that's the only place the sheet is given, so if you don't memorize it or look it up online, you're SOL for understanding what effects may be on your characters. The majority of the game's design is quite good otherwise. It manages to be non-linear with a host of locations, each with a series of secrets, but still has a clear and logical progression of stages and events. Speaking of events, the events you do encounter are, yet again, another nice reminder from Lisa that I am not your friend. A good example is the part where you are forced to choose of killing one of your active members, or having your main character be handicapped for the rest of the game. Keep in mind, your main character is a drug addict who you have to satiate in order to keep his stats up. And he is the heavy hitter of your team. And if you do choose for him to be handicapped, his stats will drop dramatically. Which is a double problem because you can't remove him from your fighting party. The game excels at these moral dilemmas. In one section, I was ambushed by a random game, and they threatened to take my currency or they would slaughter the entire town I was just in. All these scenarios are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many of them, and they're all unpleasant as hell. The game's style is, well, what it needs to be. Everybody is ugly, and the 2D sprites have a fair amount of love put into them. They clearly take inspiration from Earthbound, but the colors give it a grit that is a style all of its own. The animations are acceptable, bordering on impressive for RPG Maker. The combat animations are the same story, with some attack animations having more effort put into them than others. There is also a heavy use of stock sounds whilst in combat, so keep that in mind if that bothers you. All in all, the overall aesthetic of the game is reminiscent of a post-apocalyptic looking Earthbound. So again, what the game needs to be. The music though took a page right out of Off's book. Rather than having great music in-game, Lisa has gone with the memorable route. The soundtrack is awful. I mean, frankly, some of the songs sound worse than nails on a chalkboard. All the music sounds like someone mixed two or three completely different songs by accident. In other words, it's exactly what it needs to be, and it's perfect for this game. The soundtrack echoes the weird and unpleasant atmosphere Lisa is set to, so it's absolutely fine. Okay, so I've said all I feel I need to as for the game's assets, excluding its story and themes. I have saved the game's story for last as I feel it needs some warning before discussing. Here is that warning. Lisa is a game that is completely unafraid to address what are considered taboo themes in games. These themes may trigger people who have experienced them before or may simply be inappropriate to wary gamers. Be advised, Lisa brings up subjects such as suicide, murder, domestic abuse of children, bullying, drug abuse, and pedophilic rape. If you're put off by content that discusses these themes, then Lisa is not a game you should try. I will be lightly talking about this content and the game's story for the rest of the video, so please stop watching if you don't want these subjects to be brought up. Alright, so I heard this game was going to be dark, in humor and its subject matter, but the game seemed unrelenting and I didn't know what to expect when I started it up. The start screen is a video game's first impression on the player. Some show you set pieces, others miscellaneous images that cover the game's atmosphere and themes. This is the first impression Lisa makes. Yeah. Well, Lisa set 
well, it set a tone. So, there are two things we should take from this. One, clearly this game is going to be dark, given that there seems to be a 12-year-old girl hanging from a noose at the start screen. And two, it started up in a postage stamp-sized window. This normally is a sign that a game is lacking in quality. Except, as I explained before, this game has a tremendous amount of polish for an RPG Maker entry. This may be Lisa tempering my expectations as a design choice, like what some titles have done before it. Or it could just be a flub in design. I don't know. What it did do was make me think the game was going to suck, and I was surprised to find out that it in fact did not. Alright, story time. Lisa follows the journey of Brad after what is referred to as the Flash occurred. The Flash was a great bright light that lit up the entire world, and when the light faded there were no human females left. The world then devolved into one of sexually repressed males who use dirty magazines as currency, take fashion tips from Mad Max movies, and are reduced to violent gangs fighting one another. Brad as a child was often bullied and abused by his single alcoholic father before the Flash. Brad in his adulthood became a martial arts teacher and struggled with depression. To fix Brad's self-loathing, he began using a drug called Joy that makes the user numb to pain. The game starts off with most of this info, and then flashes to Brad in the apocalypse. He was taking joy when he finds a baby, which is impressive given it's been several years since there were any women to give birth. He takes the baby back home to his friends and they discover it's a girl. After some arguments, they agree to make a place for her underneath the house and protect her as she grows up. There is then a montage of Buddy, the girl, growing up and playing with Brad. The montage ends with you coming home to discover your friends have been murdered and Buddy is missing. You control Brad as he travels through the wasteland looking for Buddy and stopping hordes of rapists after her as well. The game's writing is probably the worst part of the game. The writing's not cringy, it's just not up to snuff with the rest of the game. Lisa's meant to be a dark comedy with some insane humor, but in the 12 hours I played, I only found a few moments actually funny. Maybe it's the writing, or maybe it's just me not finding rape humor very funny? I don't know. The writing isn't even the problem in just the jokes, though. I recall in one part I was betrayed by several people and I didn't even realize it, so I was very confused when Brad goes off the deep end and starts killing them. If it wasn't for me sucking at video games and having to replay it again, then I would never understood what was happening. The characters I interacted with also felt poorly written at times. Or perhaps it was just Brad was poorly written at times. You see, the game gives you a lot of negative choices in-game, but I always went with the ones that were morally positive or ended up helping Buddy's chances. Despite all that, characters in-game acted like Brad was an evil person bent on keeping Buddy for himself despite me making him appear as a protective father type. The game's writing is why I think the game doesn't have a fan base that either Undertale or Off has. Undertale and Off have subjects and stories they address, but the writing in each make it understandable. Off does this with a more cloak and dagger fashion, and its mad genius is only recognized at the end. This is because the events and characters were written in such a way that allude to the reality of the game's madness in the end. To be completely pretentious, it's art via symbolism. Someone conveys a piece, and viewers speculate on its value and its creation. Lisa never gave me an aha moment with its story. In fact, the game ended and I was left with far more questions than answers. There are segments where Brad suffers from withdrawal of joy and starts hallucinating, but the game never insinuates that his world may be just one big hallucination. There are even flashbacks that clearly have important characters who are never elaborated on. They also look suspiciously like some characters in lucid parts, but it's never addressed. That's the final problem with the story of the game. There's clearly loose ends I need to tie together in order to understand what's going on. But I can't tell what's Lisa being dark and quirky, and what's actually out of place narrative pieces. I thought I was pretty thorough in exploring the game, but keep in mind, I missed some stuff. So perhaps that's my problem. Sorry about the rant, this video is really long for me, but I wanted to do Lisa justice, cause this game though rough in some parts and a little bit insane in its storytelling, clearly has a lot of love put into it, and it impresses me that no one is talking about this game being it's cut from the same cloth off and Undertale are. 
both those games having a ridiculous amount of cult followers. So I think that's something I need to outright say. If you're a fan of Off, you need to pick this game up. It is right up your alley. Undertale not so much as, to be honest, Undertale's subject matter was very expertly executed, but it was done with kid gloves, and Off and Lisa both don't use kid gloves in any way, shape, or form in what they cover. And another side note is, I played what is sometimes referred to as Lisa the Painful, but there is DLC to that, which is called Lisa the Joyful. It sheds a tiny bit of light of what happens in Lisa, especially at the end of Lisa. But since I am reviewing the main game, I am not going to say much about it other than the fact that Lisa the Joyful exists. So, when it's all said and done, if you're looking for an RPG that is reminiscent of Earthbound, has a soundtrack you will remember, has a refreshing take on turn-based combat, and it all happens in a dark, depressing, post-apocalyptic world, a game whose narrative is not afraid of normal taboos, then Lisa is the game for you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you're interested in other indie games like this, you may want to subscribe to the channel. I try to put up a review bi-weekly. What's more, this channel is fairly new, so I could really use any support you can give. Alright, thanks again. Later.